This is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. This episode is brought to you by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org. What do I love about FEE? So many things do I love about FEE, and you should too. One of them is my business development director at Praxis. One of the guys who helped build Praxis from the ground up and has been there from nearly the very beginning and is unmatched, phenomenal talent to work with, Zach Slayback. What does this have to do with fee? I was a faculty member at a fee seminar many years ago, and I met Zach when he was 17. And he stood out. Like all the participants at fee seminars, he was there because he wanted to be. He was interested in ideas. He was engaged. He struck up conversation with me at every lunch and dinner and the free times. I got to know him very well, and I really enjoyed him, and we stayed in touch after that. Fast forward a few years. He was in college. He was bored. He wanted something else. He started doing work for Praxis because he just thought it was fascinating. Before long, he was indispensable. He dropped out of school. I hired him full-time, and the rest, as they say, is history. Why do I give that example? Because I want you to know just how amazing, dynamic, and high quality the young participants are at these fee seminars. That's one of the greatest reasons. The faculty are amazing. The ideas are amazing. The setting is beautiful. Fee is a well-run organization, great resources, but the people are the thing that makes the difference. And when you're in a room with 50 or 100 people over the course of three or four days who want to be there, who are engaged and excited by ideas, there is no classroom experience I can think of that matches that. The connections you make can be lifelong connections and in some cases may lead to helping to uh, found a startup a few years later, as was the case with me and Zach. Check it out, fee.org. Get to one of their seminars this year if you're between the ages of 14 and 26 fee.org, fee.org slash seminars. Tell them you heard about it here on the Isaac Morehouse podcast. All right. Welcome back to the podcast. We are kicking off a four part series. I'm really excited about this. I have not done a series before, but it's a four part series, a beginner's guide to startups. Uh, Startups are really sexy right now. Entrepreneurs are like superheroes today. They're very trendy. It's popular. You got all kinds of shows like Shark Tank and uh, Silicon Valley on the humorous end. Um, But I think that's largely a good thing. I think it's exciting. But there's a lot of people that don't really know what's going on in this whole world. And confession time, when I started Praxis, uh, this was a little, well, when I first kind of got started with the idea, it was about three years ago. I didn't know anything. I didn't, I had never gone to business school or I didn't get a business degree or anything like that. I hadn't really taken any, any classes on business and startups and business plans and any of that stuff. I was a total noob. So I didn't even know the first time I was talking with someone about the idea for Praxis, he said, so you're going to get VC. And I just said, yeah, I haven't decided yet. And then I had to go home and look up VC because I didn't know what the letters VC meant. And they mean venture capital. So don't feel bad if you don't know any of this stuff. That's what this series is all about. So today is part one, and I'm thrilled to have with us Anthony Davies. And what I love about Anthony, and, and I think is a really great guest for this first section, is that he kind of brings together the theory and the practice of entrepreneurship. So Anthony is an economist and he studies sort of macro trends in the economy. And he's, he's kind of a a numbers guy, um, has sort of a big picture understanding of entrepreneurship as sort of a, an economic category, but he himself is an entrepreneur. He has launched at least three companies. Uh, he's raised over 23 million in capital for those companies. He's had some pretty big exits, including an IPO, which means initial public offering. It means that the company went public and started selling shares. Um, So he's been there. He's been in and out of academia and the startup world um, and has a good understanding of um, sort of an overview of what it's all about. So Anthony Davies, welcome to the podcast. 
Thanks for having me, Isaac. Sorry for making you endure that really long setup. <laughs> I, sometimes I put that in later, but I kind of like when the guest can hear it so they know what they're, you know, how things are setting. I, I know where the expectations are set, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So first, before we get going, um, what did I miss on your bio? I know you had Paragon Software, Parabon Computation, and Replica, and one of those was sort of a gaming company, and the others were... Um, Right. I don't even know what. What, what did one I miss? Was, they, they, all three of them were were internet type uh, tech plays. Uh, one was gaming. One was uh, supercomputation. Is supercomputation, and uh, and the other was um, a company that, uh, that that was we were we were about ten years ahead of our time. But we did um, internet discovery. That is, imagine a piece of software that mimics your brain and scours the internet for you, comes back with things that it predicts you would like because it knows who you are, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and and there, there are a couple of others as well that, that I can't recall off the top of my head because they were failures, right? So you, you push these things <laughs> so out. So you conveniently forget them, right? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and, and you have, and this has been over how many years? This has been over the last couple decades, right? You kind of got yeah. into this in the 90s. Well, I started my uh, my first company, Paragon Software, when I was a sophomore in college, um, okay. and, and it, it, it came about for a very mundane reason that my buddy and I we were both into computers at the time, uh, needed money to buy beer. And <laughs> the, the only thing we had to trade was <laughs> was software was programming. Well, so, you know, they uh, always so, say uh, that all the best companies are started by founders who are trying to scratch their own itch. So I guess right. in this case, it was just the itch for alcohol. <laughs> Well, it, it was, but you know, the, the itch thing is very interesting because uh, once we started it, I realized it really is an itch, and I think that's why I keep going back to it. You know, my wife is, says, you know, she can, it's like clockwork. Every five to seven years, I just can't take academia anymore. I want to go start a business, yep. right? And you do that, and then when it's all done, I say to her, please don't ever let me do that again. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And five years later, I'm back out, right? You know, so it, it is an itch. Oh, it's okay, so you, you'll you know more about this analogy than I because you have uh, six children, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so tell me, th this is the analogy that I it sort of works for me is – it's like childbirth, right? As soon as you're done, you're like, we're never going through that again. Uh, you know, and this is coming from me. I'm not even the one doing the, the physical component of the labor. But but it's also like childbirth in a way that once the idea is there, once it's like it's been implanted, right? There's almost this feeling of inevitability, like this thing has to come to fruition. I don't know right. what, I, like, I know that it's going to happen. I'm kind of scared. I kind of don't know everything that's going to happen in between now and then. But once you sort of get started, once an idea captures you, it's got this inevitability factor to it. At least it, it did for me with Praxis, and that's that's the only example I have to go on here. Um, but it still has the scariness to it because you don't know how things are going to go. Um, anyway, I don't know if there's any. I don't know if that's a relevant analogy at all. Oh but. no, no, I, I think very much it is, and it's you know particularly once in a while you'll get an idea that um, that is so good you you know you know in your heart. If you don't do this, someone else is going to. Mm. So it's not a question of it being done. It's a question of who's going to do it, right? Yeah. And those things start to take on, on, on a life of, them, of their own. A friend of mine uh, likens it to, um, he, sa he says, who's all, also an entrepreneur, he says he loves to build the crank. He just doesn't like to turn it. And, and this is indicative of many entrepreneurs I know. They love to go out and start the companies. But once started... They're no longer interested, right? They'll move on and do something else. They're, you know, they that's don't want to turn the crank. Yeah, that's something I want to um, I want to get to in a bit here on the difference between a, an entrepreneur and a manager and how it's pretty rare for one person to have both of those. Um, okay, so I want to set this up. I'm going to read something. It's really brief um, about what do we mean when we say startup. Um, and I think there's something unique that that word gets tossed around a lot. You have everything from like nonprofits being like let's. Let's be a lean startup. Let's implement a startup culture, which often just means let's put in, you know, a barista in the lobby <laughs> and I'll right. sort of ride segues around the office. But there's something I'm going to read this definition that I like and you can give me your thoughts on it. This comes from Paul Graham, who um, was a founder himself. And then he set up Y Combinator, which is a, an incubator, an organization that helps startups get off the ground. So he has a blog post called Startup Equals Growth. And you can Google Paul Graham Startup Equals Growth. And this is how he describes it. He says, a startup is a company designed to grow fast. Being newly founded does not in itself make a company a startup, nor is it necessary for a startup to work on technology or take venture capital 
or to have some sort of exit, which means a sale from the original founders. The only essential thing is growth. Everything else we associate with startups follows from growth. If you want to start one, it's important to understand that. Startups are so hard that you can't be pointed off to the side and hope to succeed. You have to know that growth is what you're after. The good news is if you get growth, everything else tends to fall in place, which means you can use growth like a compass to make almost every decision you face. So I think that's kind of an interesting definition that it's about a startup specifically, not just a small business um, or a single person company or whatever you might want to consider it. Startup, when we use that word, if we want it to have some sort of a unique meaning anyway, it's about a company that's at, uh, attempting to grow really, really rapidly. It's not like opening maybe a sandwich shop or a restaurant um, that kind of has a has a ceiling, and that ceiling is we're you know we're full every night. There's not a there's not a potential for sort of exponential growth. Would you agree with that working definition of a startup? Yeah, very much. In, in fact, I've, I I was at a whole week long seminar talking about what it is to be an entrepreneur. And, uh, and as we're, we're hashing with this, we, we came up with, with an, a concept that's very similar to what you're quoting from Graham. Um, in my mind, I like to think of it as an explorer. Um, the, the, the entrepreneur, is, as he forms a startup, he's breaking new ground, right? So simply opening a restaurant, selling the same kind of thing everybody else does. You know, for example, you can uh, open up a McDonald's franchise, right? I wouldn't, in my heart, I wouldn't call that an entrepreneur. I mean, some people would, right? But what you're doing is you're treading on well-treaded ground. There's no unknowns. You know exactly who your market is. You know exactly what you're going to do, right? You just turn a switch and things happen. But, but to be an entrepreneur is to take a step out into the unknown, into a place that nobody's been before. You know, Uber is, is you know, the beautiful example of the day, right? Nobody had ever done this thing before. These guys took a chance. They started something that was completely new. So in that sense, I like the model uh, in the mind of the explorer, the pioneer. That's what I think of when I think of an entrepreneur. Yeah, and, um, you know, to, to emphasize, there's absolutely nothing morally or even practically, like, superior about uh, you know, starting something brand new versus starting another McDonald's or whatever. I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you're creating value, you'll succeed and you need to find out what's right for you. So it can be easy, I think, for people to feel startups and entrepreneurs are so cool. Well, if I don't know anything about tech and I'm not building a software company that can go from, you know, zero to a billion dollars, then I must not be cool. Um, that's don't, right. don't yeah, feel bad. I agree hundred percent. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing, there is nothing shameful at all about going out and starting up McDonald's. You're creating jobs, you're providing products for people and so forth. Uh, my, my point is simply that this, the, the, the skill set, the personality traits that are required to do that are, are markedly different in my opinion from the skill set and the, in the, in the personality traits required to be what I think of as an entrepreneur. What, what are we talking about numbers wise? Do, do, does anyone have a grasp on how many startups there are or any sort of large macro level data? Um, no, I, I, no, I don't know because you know, these things are, are hard to define, right? And until you pass a certain point, the, the best we could do is look at tax filings, right? What people have filed. Um, people who have businesses on the side will file a Schedule C to their income tax, assuming that they itemize, right? Mm. And I think it's something like 25% of, of, um, of tax returns have Schedule Cs attached to them. So one thing you might imagine is that there's about 25% of the population out there that's doing a little bit of something, right? Uh, I, again, I'm not sure I, I call them all entrepreneurs, but, but at least entrepreneurs are somewhere within that subset. So something between 0% and 25% of the population. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was trying to find some numbers and I could not find, I found one thing that said worldwide, there are 300 million people trying to start about 150 million businesses. Only one third of those will be launched, so probably 50 million new firm births every year. Um, but there's about the same number of firms that go out of business each year. Uh, and then I found another place that said there are 472 million entrepreneurs, uh, 300 million startups annually, 100 million startups opening each year. I don't. Know, so some of these numbers, it's really hard. It's really hard to get. The Kauffman Foundation has a lot of data on this, but it's hard to sort of pin it down. Um, right. Okay, well let's let's get into some you know who should try to start a company or who should who is an entrepreneur is everyone 
potentially an entrepreneur or is this something, uh, can they be born? I mean, are they born or can they be made sort of the, the who question? If someone's listening and they're saying, am I an entrepreneur? What questions do I ask myself to, to figure that out? What would you say? Where would they, where should they start? Yes. Yeah, so, so ultimately it's, it's a personal matter, right? Only the person himself can, can say, uh, however, there, there's three kind of personality traits that I think are common to all entrepreneurs. One is creativity, right? And by creativity, um, I don't necessarily mean, you know, things like music or painting or something, but the ability to take two disparate things, p- things two things that people would never consider putting together and, and, and imagining putting these two things together, right? So the guy who imagines taxis and apps, Right. This is very disparate things. This is this is indicative of creativity, being able to to think like that. Um, So that's one. Self-direction is another. That's a big one. To be a successful entrepreneur, uh, you've got to be able to work in an environment, not just work, but work very successfully in an environment where nobody is telling you what to do, when to do it or how to do it. Uh, You've got to in, in in a very true sense, you've got to be able to be your own manager. Um, so, so that, and then finally, you've got to be what I call a prudent risk taker, not just a risk taker, but a prudent one. And prudent risk taking means someone who is able to, to see an opportunity and realistically see the risk associated with it, and then be able to weigh the two. And if, if he comes to the conclusion that, yeah, the, the potential opportunity here outweighs the risk, this is, and the person is then someone who would go and take that risk. That's that's indicative of an entrepreneur. Uh, what is not indicative of an entrepreneur are the two extremes. The one extreme where um, the person's refusing to take a risk at all, no matter what the potential payoff, and the other extreme where the person will take every risk that comes along, regardless of how low the payoff is, <laughs> right? Neither one of those are entrepreneurs. You know, the, the second point you mentioned, so you said the three traits, creativity, self-direction, and prudent risk-taking. Self-direction is one of those things that I think when you hear it in the abstract, oh, no one's telling you what to do, you direct yourself, everyone says, wow, that sounds great, no bosses, you know, yay. That is one of the most difficult and stressful things when you've got, you know you have to make all kinds of progress with your business to, to, to be profitable, to not lose all your money, to not go out of business, but you don't know. You, there are literally an infinite number of activities you could be engaging in, and there's no playbook. There's no person right. who says, do this first, focus on this first. You know, you can read books and best practices, but nobody, nobody's ever built your business before. So you, you don't know what to do with every hour, every minute of your day. What's the best use of that? And that's actually a tremendous, tremendous challenge and a, and a huge stress point. And I think a lot of people actually don't enjoy being in that environment as much as sort of the idea of not having a boss sounds great. Um, it's more like, you have a boss. It's ultimately your ability, you know, your customer, your ability to, to make a profit, but they don't speak to you at all. They just have uh, wants and needs and they'll fire you if you don't figure right. them out, <laughs> but they don't tell right. you what yeah. they are. They're not going to tell you what they want. They're just not going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very much, you know, it's interesting because people say they, they would like a, a, an environment which are not self-directed. I think what people really mean is they would like an environment without a boss, but a paycheck. <laughs> yes. And the thing about being an entrepreneur is, you know, all right, yes, you don't have a boss, but the flip side of it is every minute you aren't spending doing something to add value is a minute that you aren't earning money that's going to put food on your table. Who, I mean, do you think that some people, you know, like can anybody become an entrepreneur? Or do you think some people just should, like some people just don't have these traits and they can't be taught and it's just not a good fit? Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, my tendency has always been to say that entrepreneurs are, are born, they're not made. And I think as I, I've observed more, I kind of soften on that. And I, I'd say something a little bit softer, which is, yeah, maybe you can make an entrepreneur out of someone who isn't, but the person is not going to be happy. Yeah, yeah. So so in that That's sense, a good it, distinction. it is born. Huh. That's a very good distinction. Yeah, you know, I, we kind of, we talk about this a lot at, at Praxis, and, and I, I sort of think along similar lines that, we can't create entrepreneurs, but I think that people are born with at least some entrepreneurial uh, spark and ability. That's 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 kind of how how people learn to walk and to talk early on. It's this right. sort of process of making new combinations and trying new things. And then at some point, everyone has a different sort of set of set of preferences in terms of their risk taking, in terms of what's going to bring them happiness. And a lot of people have 
an entrepreneurial ability interest, but it's kind of latent because they've never been in a context to discover if that's really them. And so sort of, sort of putting people in that environment and letting them figure out, is this really for me? Do I actually want this seeing what it's like and making that decision? And, and I think the way you put it that, yeah, you could do it, but, um, you're not going to be happy. Not everyone's going to be happy doing it. And, and that's the key is finding when, you know, are you going to be happy doing that? Yeah. And, and I, and I think that the times are changing. Um, it, you know, if you look at the, the current batch of students who are going through college or, or high school and then going on to get jobs, the average, the average young person now is going to hold many jobs. I don't know what the number is, but it's a very large number, many jobs be, you know, by the time he retires. And it's almost as if, uh, American workers are becoming individual entrepreneurs. Uh, they're shops that sell labor, mm-hmm. you know, and okay, for the next 18 months, I'm going to sell my labor to company X. And then the 18 months after that, I'm going to sell my labor to company Y. That it starts to look much more like an entrepreneur there, um, maybe in a serial sense, and you have one customer at a time. Uh, but, it, but it's a very different it's a very different environment that's that's evolving now compared to uh, the the relationship of, of American workers to employers, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Well, and that's right up your alley because this is, I think, a really powerful way to explain this or understand it is classic economic theory. The, the theory of the firm is that firms exist because they reduce transaction costs so that you don't have to, you know, each individual doesn't go, have to hire a new contractor to do every every new task every single time. Um, because those, those transactions involve costs. So you create these permanent relationships where you have your IT guy who just works there all the time instead of going out. But technology has reduced transaction costs so much in so many areas that the calculus changes and it's not always advantageous for firms to have all these full-time employees as much as it used to be. So there's a lot more of a sort of contractor, freelancer, uh, a lot more mobility. It, it's a really interesting, um, you know, it's a really interesting development. Right. Right. So, okay. Let's say someone says, all right, I think, I think I am going to be happy, uh, being an entrepreneur. I think this is something I've got the itch. What questions should they answer? They've maybe they've got an idea for a business and they're, they're trying to move it forward and, and get it from, you know, out of their brain into the world. What questions should they start with? Well, I, I would start with the question of who's your who's your customer, right? So you're going to produce this thing, whatever it is, and someone's going to buy it from you. And you have to be very careful about what you mean by who's your customer. I, I like to ask people, um, you know, think about Facebook. Who is Facebook's customer? And 99% of people say, well, it's the people who use Facebook. And it's not. <laughs> They're actually the input that, are, that Facebook uses to produce a product. The Facebook's customer are the advertisers, and the product that Facebook produces is advertising. The people who use Facebook are just off on the side somehow, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're the, the materials that Facebook uses to manufacture and sell its product. So be very clear about who your customer is. Um, and then be very clear about how you're going to generate revenue. And here you have to be careful that customer and revenue uh, source are not necessarily the same thing. So you imagine, all right, well, here's Facebook. It's going to sell advertising. So every advertiser I have is, is, is a revenue source. And that's actually not correct. The advertisers are your customers, but how are you delivering your product? In Facebook's case, it's through advertising. If somebody sees an ad, um, the, you know, the, the um, Facebook earns a little bit of money. Or if somebody clicks on the ad, Facebook earns more money. So the revenue sources are not the customers, that is the advertisers. The revenue source are, is people's interactions with the ads, either looking at them or clicking on them, something like this. So be, be very clear about who your customer is, how you generate the revenue, um, who your competitors are, right? So the first thing that's going to happen if you, when you get to the point of looking for some investment money, first question is who are your competitors and uh, you know, why is it that you can do better than they can? And when you think about competitors, think not just about the present, but think about the future as well. So let's go back to Uber as an example. Uber's competitor currently are taxis. In about five years, Uber's competitor is going to be Chrysler and Toyota, who are selling self-driving cars. Mm. And about three years after that, Uber's competitor are going to be car co-ops, where a car co-op is a uh, a set of households or a set of friends or something who who buy amongst them several cars. And these cars, which which are self-driving, now are used like a pool amongst all these people. 
right? That's going to eat very hard into uh, in, into Uber's market. So when you think about competitors, and, and hopefully followed by jet packs and the ability to right, beam yeah. ourselves, you know, to other places. <laughs> right, right. And, and the thing is, particularly when you think about future competitors, that provides a map to where your business should be going. So Uber, I'm sure the smart people there are already thinking about founding car co-ops themselves under the Uber brand, right? When when uh, self-driving cars become a thing. So, so thinking about future competitors not, not only makes you wary of who's going to be up against you in the future, but gives you a little bit of a, of a clue as to what path you should be taking. Can I ask you a question about competitors before we yeah. get on some of the other questions? So let's say somebody's got this idea for a really cool thing. They think it's brand new and it's, it's going to be revolutionary. And then they go start poking around. And I've, and I've had many conversations with people like this um, before. And they find a competitor, someone else that's already doing it or trying to do it. And the immediate reaction is to get depressed or angry. Like right. I'm too late. Someone stole my idea. Is that the right reaction or is the right reaction? Good. This is proof that my idea isn't crazy. Yeah. I, I, I think the latter one, this is, this is uh, proof that you've got a good idea, right? And then the next thing you do is you take a deep breath and you start asking, what is this guy not doing that he should be? Right? So what about this product isn't working in how would you do it better? Uh, whether it's in delivery or the nature of the product or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and, and even if the guy's doing everything well and right, that doesn't mean there's no room for you, right? Think about Lyft. Uh, Uber had this beautiful business model. Lyft comes along. It's in the same space doing the same thing, and yet the market is large enough that there's no reason why two can't be there. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll get three or four moving into the future. Yeah. Yeah, Peter Thiel has this great line. He says, you know, we, we all talk about the first mover advantage. You know, you're the first to market with a new idea. Then there's a bunch of copycats. But that first mover is the one we think of as having all the advantages. And he says, that's that's kind of rewriting history. Really, it's the last mover advantage. Right. <laughs> Whoever yeah. was, a, you know, when MySpace was first and then Facebook came and now Facebook is the last, nobody's trying to launch a competitor to Facebook because they, or Google, right? They, were, they weren't the first mover. They were the last mover. They were the one that do it so well that, it's really nobody else has room anymore. Oh, this is absolutely right. You know, think about, um, you know, everybody's got a cell phone in their pockets now. Who's, who is the first mover? It was Iridium. And I'm sure nobody knows what Iridium is. That's because the thing went bankrupt. It was a horrible <laughs> business model, but it was the first, it was the first company in that space. Hmm. So yeah, the first one uh, often is not what ends up being the winner. Okay. So we have, who's your customer? How do you generate revenue? Who are your competitors? What are some of the other questions? Uh, an important question is what's the barrier to entry and why doesn't it apply to you, right? So there's, if, if, you're, if you're talking about moving into, into an industry, it, it, oftentimes you're founding a new industry, right, when you're, if you're an interesting entrepreneur, um, the question is why can't someone come along behind you and do this too? And what is it that enables you to do it when the next guy can't? So particularly, you know, I, I know the tech space, so I talk about tech. The, the big thing that, that people talk about is inter intellectual property, right? Well, if I get there first, I can get a patent on this, and the patent is going to be a barrier to entry to prevent other people from coming along and, and competing with me. And actually, in the tech industry, patents end up not being that important. Hmm. And the reason they aren't that important, they, there is a barrier to entry, but that's not it. The reason they're not important is because the patent process takes an incredibly long period of time compared to the speed with which the tech sector develops. So the barrier to entry in tech, going back to our previous uh, topic, is get there first. Mm. If mm. you're there first, you can establish a foothold and that makes it harder for the guy who's coming behind you. Because there's right? such a strong network effect. So many tech things are based on uh, increasing value, the, the increased number of users you have. Exactly. Exactly. Someone wants to compete with Facebook. They're going to have a heck of a time because the value of Facebook lies in the number of people who are using it. And people are generally not going to want to sign up for another thing. That's why Google Plus, for example, just never really <laughs> took off. Right. Everybody was already on Facebook. Hmm. So um, that's really so the barriers to entry. And when you say, why do they not apply to you? Give me give me a concrete way, um, a concrete way to sort of deal with that question. So so you can see barriers to entry in a new industry or creating a new service, but there's something unique about your approach that allows you to bypass them. Is that what you mean? Right. So there's something about you that, that enables, the, that causes the barrier not to apply. So mm -hmm. when I was with, uh, with Parabon, um, you know, the, the big thing was we had to get people who had computers to sign up to use our service. And it was, it was a network effect thing like Facebook. 
And so the, there is no barrier to entry because nobody's using any service at all. But we come in, we get them signed up. Like Facebook, you come in, you get people signed up. And now once they're signed up, that provides a barrier to entry to the next guy. Gotcha. So it didn't apply to you, but it's going to apply to the next person. All right. So um, what other questions we have? So, all right, after you've you know gotten all excited about your, your product and, and how you're going to sell it and all of this stuff, um, <clears throat> you need to start thinking uh, clearly about numbers, right? And, th- and this is where people go off the rails uh, <laughs> frequently because, <clears throat> because they'll, they'll get excited about the idea and they'll think about how they're going to sell it and all that. And then they'll immediately go to designing business cards. For God's sake, don't do that. <laughs> the two thing, the two things, are, the three things. This is, this is what everyone, when they got a business idea, and I'm guilty of this. I've done this many times over the years with that stupid ideas I've had. You buy the URL for like ten bucks, you know, on right. Daddy. You get, you create a logo, and you get a business card, and then you're like, right. I've, I've got a startup. Look, it's right here. I have the proof. Right. Yeah. Exactly. The, the reason you don't want to mess with that, you know, don't mess with naming the company, any of that stuff. First off, it's a waste of your time. There are far more important things you need to be doing. Secondly, when it gets to the point that you actually really do need business cards and a name and all of that, you need to turn to someone who has an expertise in that, in graphic design, in picking the right name. Um, when we were at Par- when I was at Parabon, we went under a code name for the first Look, two so years. Parabon of isn't like your childhood dog's name or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Parabon was under a code name for the first two years. And, um, and uh, when it came time to select a name, we actually hired a, uh, a, a professional group to come in and give us, you know, they, they vetted these things, make sure that this is not something crass in a foreign language, uh, make sure, you know, it has the, the emphasis on the right syllables, all this nonsense, right? But this stuff that you don't need to deal with as the entrepreneur and you don't have an expertise in it anyway. So let's get to what you do need to deal with. What you do need to deal with <clears throat> are the following sequence of questions. What's your market opportunity? What's your revenue opportunity? What's your revenue driver? Mm-hmm. So the market opportunity is, uh, you know, think very large. Uh, what's what's the total if you're thinking about Uber? Well, here are, you know, people spend X billion dollars on transportation a year. This is a this is a, the market opportunity. Okay, what's your revenue opportunity? Your revenue opportunity is a slice of that, right? Because everybody who's looking for transportation is not necessarily looking for the specific thing you're offering. So you think about subsets. There's transportation, there's ground transportation. Within that, there's ground transportation in a hired vehicle as opposed to ground transportation in an owned vehicle. And then within that, there's short short run, you know, short distance transportation. That's the, that's the revenue opportunity. That's where you're playing. So as you think about this, it helps you, it does two things. It helps you to put the numbers in perspective. So you're not just throwing out, you know, millions and billions words. It helps you to put the market in perspective. Also, it helps you to communicate when you eventually come time to talk to investors, to communicate exactly where you live within this this economy. So the investor is comfortable that you've thought this through and that you have a realistic view of what you can do with with your idea. Hmm. There's a there's a great little section. I'm going to refer to this book again, probably numerous times throughout this uh, four part series, Zero to One by by Peter Thiel, and he talks about this finding your market and and there's kind of this balance. You want to find a market that's small enough that you could legitimately dominate it, like your slice or your niche of that market, but that's big enough that dominating it actually matters. So he gives an example right. of you know, oh, I'm going to open a British Thai fusion restaurant in Berkeley. And I will dominate that niche because there's no other restaurants serving that particular niche. Great. But you're going to dominate a niche of like 10 people. And on the other side, people that claim that their market is like, well, I'm selling something that appeals to all 7 billion of the Earth's inhabitants. So the market is huge. You, you, you can't dominate that market. So finding something that is niche enough, you know, that sort of your subset of a subset as you mentioned, you know, transportation, ground transportation, rented, you know, non-owned ground transportation. Um, there's a subset that you can dominate, and if you dominate it, it's still big enough to have a huge, huge revenue opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So the revenue driver, what is what does that mean? Well, the the question there is, what is it that's actually bringing revenue to you, right? So we, think of it as a machine, and there's a lever. The, and you push the lever and money comes out. What specifically is that lever? You know, is it, is your, is, is it advertising that's driving your revenue? Is it a you know, word of mouth that's driving your revenue? Is it, um, you know, um, 
if you're on Facebook, you're getting people to click, that's driving your revenue. What is it that actually causes money to come in? You know, think about games on, on apps, right? Uh, apps on, on, on your phone. The revenue driver there is not getting someone to play your game, pretty much. It used to be for a while, you know, 99 cents, you get to get this game. So anyone who buys the game, that's your revenue driver. Now it's something different. They give away the game mm. and you can play it. And then if you want to add things on to it, you can pay some money to do that, right? So if I want to get through, um, you know, multiple levels of, of whatever my Clash game of is. Clans. Right. Exactly. I can slog my way through or I can spend 10 bucks and leapfrog. Yeah. So the revenue driver <clears throat> there is, is the experience within the game as opposed to the person buying the game uh, to begin with. So this, this is being, being very clear about this. And if you, if you get the revenue driver wrong, you can end up really shooting yourself in the foot. You know, this is a this is an area where I see a lot of in this sort of trendy era of sexy startups and incubators. This is an area where I see not not only getting it wrong, but a lot of people just forgetting to identify in the first place. So you can you can right. really easily get caught up in the trappings. Like, okay, I mean, I've even seen places that have gotten significant funding from investors do this. We got a half a million dollars, whatever. So we opened an office, it's downtown, it's got a cool, uh, you know, somebody painted a mural on the wall, some street artist, we've got a coffee shop inside. And we're putting all of our energy into sort of managing this company, but none of the things that we're putting energy into are actually driving revenue. The mural on the wall doesn't drive revenue. The the internal process that we optimize, the the you know, software, the database software we bought to manage our customers, which is really sleek and top of the line, that doesn't drive revenue. So it's, it's like you can get caught up in all the activities that feel like you're building something, but what you're right. building is, is not the part that actually drives revenue, which could be dangerous. Yeah. And this is where you know, we're, you're starting to get into the realm now of where the entrepreneur needs to bring on some other people, mm -hmm. because some of these questions become technical enough that you need someone who has some understanding of finance or of marketing or advertising, this sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't mean you should go out and hire these people, but it does mean that you should find some some trusted advisors that you can go and ask some questions to. Are there any other questions before we get to sort of some of the ways that you can clarify these questions with some different documents and things? Well, the big question is going to be, you know, remaining is how, what's it going to cost to get to where you want to be? And, uh, you know, as we build out our documents, that will become more obvious. One of the things that entrepreneurs have to be extremely careful about <clears throat> is getting caught up in the, uh, in the hype of their company, right? This is really interesting. We're going to do this cool thing. Everybody says that it's going to be wonderful. And so what is your tendency? Your tendency is to go out and hire a secretary. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you want to spend as little money as possible, right? So when you think about what does it cost to get to market, think in a very, in a very realistic sense. You know, if we can literally work out of my garage rather than having to pay rent for some you know, office somewhere. If we can do that, how long can we do it? And what kind of cost is it going to, what's it going to cost us over the next 12 months? And at the end of the 12 months, where are we going to be? So this is the kind of thing you need to be thinking. There's a great story about that relates to this um, Airbnb when they got started. It was these two guys and they had the, the basic idea and they had the basic website up and they had identified very clearly, very early, the revenue driver is people booking nights in other people's homes. So what do you need if someone goes to the website to book? You need an inventory of bedrooms, homes that they can actually book. And so they didn't go out and hire a secretary, a sales team, all this stuff. They literally, the two founders, went door to door in New York City, like door to door, apartment to apartment for, it was a couple months at least, knocking on doors individually with hand printed flyers saying, hey, would you be willing to list a spare room on our website, huh. blah, 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 blah. And they built up the inventory first because all the other stuff, their website, their user experience, all the cool stuff about the culture, that can all come when you have the sales to justify it. But they went out and they got that those sales first. They got the revenue driver first before they put in a bunch of money. And I thought it was a, I think it's a really great example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are all the questions. Really, I'm going to quickly go through them again. And I'm and I'm going to post, by the way, uh, listeners, a PDF of this presentation will be up with the show notes. It's really, really, um, really handy. So who's your customer? How do you generate revenue? Who are your competitors? What are the barriers to entry? Why do they not apply to you? What is the market opportunity? What is the revenue opportunity? What's the revenue driver? And what does it cost to get to market? Okay, so in thinking through these questions and sort of hammering them down with more clarity requires documents. 
And right. how important are documents? I've heard people say things like a business plan is just stupid. You just need to like build your thing and start selling it. That's all that matters. You can do that stuff later. I've heard other people say, you've got to get your business plan right. You've got to answer all these questions in a, in a really nice, logical spreadsheet. What, what is your take on this? Yeah, I think, I think it depends in part on what it is that you're doing and where you want to go. You know, if you're starting a little something, I've got a beehive, I'm going to you know, raise some bees and sell some honey. You don't need a business plan for that. I mean, unless you're looking to grow to, to industrial strength within, you know, 12, 24 months. You know, so I, I just do my thing. I raise my bees, I sell some money, and as the money comes in, I do more and more. So there's not, there isn't any plan there. <clears throat> if you're talking about something that's going to require employees or maybe equipment, this sort of thing, you need a plan because you can you can sink your entire effort by doing things in the wrong order, even if they're the right things to be done. Hmm. So this is where the, the documents become very helpful. And, and I and would also add that it's very common to think about like a, whether it's a pitch deck or a business model or revenue projections. Yes, these are obviously very valuable and necessary if you're going to go raise money from an investor. But even if you're not, if you're bootstrapping it, the value of what it does for your own thinking and your own clarity about your business can be really, really immense. Yeah, a absolutely. It's a good opportunity for you to identify holes in your thinking when you have to lay everything out. Uh, so, so what you want to do is you, you want to do several things. You want to uh, build, uh, we say build your documents. This is a, a, your business plan. And you build the business plan and um, you then build along with it what we call a deck, which is a set of 10 to 15 slides. If you're going to be going after uh, investor money, you need the deck. If you're not going after investor money, you don't need to fool with the deck. But I think you need the business plan either way. You need to do this before you put together your, your initial team. So, so start off by describing your product in a dozen words, right? In just a dozen. If, you, if it's going to take you 10 minutes to to tell me what it is you're doing, that tells me you don't have a firm grasp of what your product is. So describe your product and use analogies where possible. So I, I go back to, to Parabon, you know, the, the company we're doing, we did internet-based uh, supercomputing. And so in, in a single word, I can tell you, Parabon is the zip cars of supercomputing. Hmm. Now, people who know zip cars, right, you just, you walk up, it's sitting on the street, you drive it wherever you want, you leave it there and you walk away, right? This is zip car, use it when you need it and walk away when you don't. That analogy helps to summarize what Par what Parabon does. Hmm. So the analogy, and then and this is incredibly important, identify the pain point. That is, your people are going to pay you money for solving problems that they need solved. That is, they are experiencing some pain. You're going to take the pain away from them. What is it that you're doing? In the case of, uh, of Parabon, um, the problem is, uh, in, until Parabon came along, the way you got supercomputing power was to buy a supercomputer. Well, that's like wanting a beer, and to have the beer, you've got to purchase a bar. <laughs> right? that's, a, that's ridiculous. It's an incredible pain point. It's a great oh, analogy, beer, yeah. Right? Yeah, so, so similarly, the pain point is you've got people out there who, who, who need supercomputing uh, power, but they, they only need it for 10 minutes. They don't want to spend you know, $50 million on a machine. And that's the pain point that, that, that Parabon uh, hit. So every business is going to address some pain point, get it very well, and that's going to help guide not just how you flesh out your product, but also how you communicate your product hmm. to potential customers. All right, we are going to walk through um, what is included in the business plan here, uh, as well as a brief overview of what kind of investors there are. We're going to have in, in some um, future episodes on this on this beginner's guide, we're going to go into more in depth on the investing side. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. Mitch Broderick will be making over six figures again this year, as he did last year. He has no degree. Most of his peers and friends from high school are still in college, about to finish up, hoping to get a decent job. Mitch is crushing it. He dropped out of college and joined Praxis. He was working at an amazing company, helping entrepreneurs market and promote themselves. That company 
even though they typically require a degree to get hired there. They didn't need that because he was working there through the Praxis program. When the program was done, they hired him on full-time. He is a VP of sales there. He just told me the other day how much he loves his life and how much he could not have done it, how he's aware that he would not be at that spot hadn't he taken the leap and joined Praxis instead of spending more time in the classroom. Results may vary, of course. But if you think you have what it takes to engage in the real world, to work alongside entrepreneurs and doers and innovators, and not just read about the world and try to pick a major from a hat, oh, I think I want to do marketing. How do you know? Get out in the world and engage with it. Join Praxis, apply at discoverpraxis.com slash apply and see if Praxis is a fit for you. We have classes that begin every month. It's a 12-month program. The net cost is zero. What you earn from your business partner equals what you pay in tuition. And you join a lifetime network. You get coaching. You get all kinds of amazing, unique, one-of-a-kind curriculum resources to help you with your professional development and achieve your goals. You get the work experience. And at the end of the program, if you're good, the company you work for will probably want to hire you on. It's like a 10-month interview at this business, and you get to impress them and show them what you've got. In addition, we've got a whole network of other companies, and we work hard with you to help you get to your next spot where you want to be, whether it's launching your own business or continuing to work for another one until you're ready. Check it out, discoverpraxis.com. Join Mitch Broderick in the education revolution. And we're back. All right, Ant, do you think we can run through this? in about 10 minutes. Is that doable? This is a challenge. Oh, I think it is. All I right. Is. You you take it away, the business All plan. Right. So what, what you're doing here with building a business plan is you are describing your product and then laying out kind of the financing of what it's gonna to take to get where you need to go. And as you do this, remember that your goal here is to communicate concisely what it is that you're doing but it's also a sanity check to make sure that you haven't you know, run off the rails thinking this thing is going to bring you in trillions of dollars when, in fact, the market is much smaller, right? So, so in building the business plan, the place I start after I have defined this is the product and, and I've got a good analogy of what it is and I've identified the pain points that I'm going to serve, um, what I do is, is head to the financing. And by financing, I, I don't mean financing the company, but rather um, what what sorts of, of revenue can this company bring in? And there's three ways you want to deal with this, right? We, we do what's called a top-down sales forecast, where you start off by looking at the entire market and slicing it up and saying, you know, the market for personal ground transportation is very large. It's $87 billion. And the market for higher transportation is smaller. It's a subset. And there's another subset within that. There's another subset within that market that's about, you know, $50 million or whatever it is. And that's where I'm going to play. Mm-hmm. So, so you, sh- you show the big picture and then funnel down to this is, the, this is the, the size of the market I think I can capture in the first year, the first two years or whatever it is. That's top down. Then you do a bottom-up analysis. And with a bottom-up analysis, you now start in the weeds. You say, look, um, how many many salespeople can I hire uh, over a 12-month period? And what's a reasonable amount of of sales that these people could bring in? And understand that when you first bring them in, they're going to ramp up, so they're not going to be working at at maximum efficiency. In the next year, they're going to do better, and the next year, they're going to do better than that. So you can can show how these salespeople are um, hitting missing quota the first year, hitting at the second, exceeding at the third, something like that. And account for the fact that you're going to have some some turnover here. So you hire 25 guys, and of the 25 guys, at the end of the year, five of them have quit. You're left with 20. So you've got 20 now who are moderately experienced, but you got to ha- you know you you've lost the five who who would have helped you out. Year three, you're going to lose some more of those. Year four, you're going to lose some more of those. And, and are you so, just sort of making these numbers up with like a reasonable yes, gut check? You are. Okay. You are complete swag. Right? <laughs> And, and, and don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. So, so let me finish this third one, and then I'll show you why this, why this is okay. The third one is the, is the sale, pipeline sales forecast. So there you're, you're tracing out, rather than thinking about um, how many employee, how many salespeople to have to buy, hire, and how much can they sell over what period of time, you're now thinking about the sales process itself. 
when I approach a customer on day one, how many days does it take before we get to the next stage, whatever the next stage in a relationship is? For example, the customer requests a follow-up. How long does that take? Well, maybe let's say it takes three months. Okay, it takes three months to get from initial contact to follow-up. And of the people you initially contacted, how many are going to follow up? I don't know. Let's pick a number. How about 30%? 30% ask for a follow-up. Okay, fine. Of those that, that ask for a follow-up, let's say three months later, um, some percentage of those will request contracts. And then three months after that, some percentage of those who requested contracts will, ask, will actually close the deal. So what you have built now is this funnel, this pipeline, where if you stick in 100 initial contacts on the month zero end, by the time you get to the month 12 end, you've got 40 deals falling out the end. Now, these are complete swag numbers. Here's where the whole thing becomes important. You've talked about your sales, your market from three perspectives, top down, bottom up, and then pipeline. You want all three of those things to agree. Now, everybody understands, including the investors, that we have no idea how much you're going to be able to sell. But if you can show me these three approaches and each approach individually at least looks reasonable, right? You're yeah. not saying something like, oh, I'm going to hire 10,000 salespeople or, or I'm going to you know, right. close all 100 leads in the first month or something. Right. So, so each, each, each approach is reasonable unto itself. And then importantly, each of those three approaches give you the same result. Hmm. You've now got something that's hanging together. And it's kind of the best you can do, given that nobody knows what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really beautiful combination because it gives you not only a sense of what you need to do in order to have X amount of revenue, what that amount of revenue represents. It, it does At that, are you tapped out? Have you reached the full market potential or are you just getting started? And then also the time lag, which can be really huge for your own projections but also for investors in terms of what's called the burn rate, how much money you're burning through every month. So if you know we're burning through $20,000 a month, but our sales cycle takes 12 months, then you don't have to worry as much as long as you can get to when you start to close those deals. It just, it lets you see that maybe cash flow a little bit as well. Yeah. It, it, it helps tremendously on, 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 uh, on, uh, controlling and, and, and predicting the cash flow. It, it also saves you some great embarrassment. You know, the, the last thing you want to do is go before some potential investors and say, well, I think I'm going to make $1.6 million, uh, at the end of year four. And you know, the guy says, well, how many salespeople is that going to, is that going to take to do that? Right. And you don't know, or <laughs> worse, you say, I think we can do it with two. And he says, hang on. Do you mean each of your salespeople are going to be selling eight hundred thousand dollars a year? Right now, you look stupid. You haven't even thought this thing through. Yep. These are these three approaches help you to 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 make a story, and you are making a story. But it helps you to make a story that at least makes sense when you tear it apart. Hmm. All right, I know we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off. We're not gonna go through types of investors because I think we can get into that into some depth. Um, right. But, in one but, of the other. Uh, Go ahead, go ahead. You, yeah, let me give you the, the, uh, what I consider probably the most important piece of advice at this stage, right? At this stage is don't confuse entrepreneurial skill for managerial skill. Mm -hmm. That is, just because you're good at, at building the crank doesn't mean you're good at turning it. At some point, the entrepreneur, some entrepreneurs are good at managing, but many of them aren't. At some point, you've got to be prepared to step away from the company mm -hmm. if you want to succeed and let someone who has better skills run it. Well, that was going to be my last question for you, Ant, is, is a team. How do you find those managerial people? How do you decide? How do you build that initial team? It's, this is where, this goes to my second point, actually, which is don't be afraid of, of taking on investors. Um, people, entrepreneurs get very um, defensive about bringing on investors because they say, well, I have to give up so much of the company. Entrepreneurs have this, this idea that they should hold on to 100% of their company. This is actually a very bad idea. You want to bring on investors and you want, and they're going to want a slice of the company and you need to feel comfortable doing that. Don't have in your mind that the investor is going to just take my company, run away and leave me in the dark. What the investor is doing is investing in you as an entrepreneur, right? He'd be cutting off his own nose if, if he does that. He wants a partnership. The investor brings along more than simply money. The investor brings along contacts. So when you're trying to build your team, 
you can turn to your investor who has a financial stake in your company and who is connected in ways that you aren't and maybe sees things that you don't see. And you can say to this person, look, I need someone who, who's good at marketing to come on board. And this is the time when the investor says to you, yes, you do. But more than that, you need someone who's skilled in finance. And I've got a guy right here. Hmm. So, so this sort of, of advice and guidance is, is incredibly valuable. It, and it comes from entrepreneurs You're, or it comes from investors. It's, they're not simply putting money in. They're bringing their experience. Anthony, this has been absolutely awesome. Um, Anthony has a lot of great resources on his personal website, antolin-davies.com. As I said, we're going to put up a um, PDF that includes basically everything that we've walked through here uh, today and even some some extra bonus material. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or words for people who are who are on that precipice and thinking about jumping into the world of startups? Yeah, yeah, I would say just do it. <laughs> because particularly if you're young, right, even if you fail, and, and this is what made my decision on my first company, I, I, I asked myself 20, 30 years from now, even if I fail, do I want to look back on this and say I didn't, I didn't try? Mm-hmm. And, and I realized, no, even if, even if I were to fail, I want to look back and say I gave it a shot. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us. This has been awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. You bet.